Hello, my name is uh, Freek Bakker from Wageningen University in the Netherlands and uh, I'm going to share some thoughts with you today on herbarium genomics and how to get plant archival DNA to work. But first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this symposium, of course, to of this workshop to invite me to contribute, which is very nice. And I think the workshop uh, looks like a very interesting program. Now, so um, herbarium genomics, there's been quite a few terms kicking around over the last decade. And with regards um, herbarium, you could say that, well, we indeed we have today herbarium genomics. Herbaria can be seen as dead DNA repositories. And actually herbarium DNA could be considered a sort of not so ancient DNA, although there are similarities with proper ancient DNA, as we shall see later on. This is a study a couple of years ago. You may have seen this yourself. And Weber et al. describes that there may be like 70,000 species uh, still waiting to be described, residing in our herbarium collections. So it would be really nice to have at a large scale um, the use of DNA from these uh, species and expediting their description process. In the literature, we've seen some very nice cases, for instance, finding sister species to important crops, such as melon here. That was only discovered after systematically herbarium specimens around the crop targets had been sequenced. Um, identifying gaps in sampling or taxonomic mistakes, perhaps, or name giving after sequencing an entire fungal herbarium several years ago. Yeah, and of course, this case with um, the Irish Great Famine in the 1840s that cost the life of so many people. Um, this was a very nice publication by Yoshida et al. a couple of years ago, where they were able to, from herbarium that was made at the time, um, extract the Phytophthora mitochondrial DNA. And it was sequenced, and then it was put in a phylogenetic perspective of other Phytophtheras, and uh, concluded that this, this outbreak was a one-off thing, a one-off genotype that has not been seen. Uh, since then, fortunately. Ancient alleles, um, herbarium specimens have been quite uh, instrumental in, in um, finding out what genes confer uh, resistance against herbicides, because there was some specimens found with the same substitution that today causes herbicide resistance, but it was in an historic sample predating the use of herbicides, which can be useful to take into account when you develop strains for further resistance. Yeah, and then of course, extinct uh, lineages such as this genus here in the Oleaceae. Uh, the plant is gone, but there is still herbarium specimen. And these authors were able to sequence mitochondrial DNA, I believe, and place it in a phylogenetic framework. Um, a while ago, Mike Martin and myself, we, we edited a special issue in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution, and it was nice to see the um, attention that people had to uh, this work and several manuscripts that we could um, edit and publish in that special issue. So the interest in the use of this kind of collection-based uh, DNA is definitely increasing, and therefore also nice to see the workshop that we're in today. A couple of years ago, I uh, coordinated a joint research activity on herbarium DNA as part of the synthesis program that you may be well aware of. Uh, and we focused on questions such as should we optimize herbarium DNA extraction protocols? Should we worry about post-mortem damage? Can we trust the sequences that we obtain? How about old uh, precious type specimens? Is it worth sacrificing bits of that? Can we do genomics on herbarium DNA? Should we worry about other contamination, etc.? And this led to several activities. 
uh, like an, an workshop on herbarium DNA extraction, taking into account that plant secondary chemistry, but also specimen age, as well as tissue preservation, the way in which it was preserved, will all affect the efficiency of herbarium DNA extraction. Um, this resulted in a study by Tina Sarkeen and et al. Plus one, 2012, where she used a whole panel of herbarium specimens, including quite recalcitrant ones, and uh, 47 herbarium specimens, I believe, and then do different, uh, uh, amplify different regions from the extracted DNA with different tuck polymerases and different cleaning up methods. And um, this result yielded actually that CTAP and uh, normal tuck polymerase was performing probably best. But I refer to the paper if you want to read more about that. Another thing we did in this project was with Martijn Staats, my postdoc at the time. And Martijn, what he did is look at four different, select four different trees that were growing in the Leiden Botanical Gardens and for which we had herbarium uh, that was made in those uh, times uh, b before. So we had the old herbarium of these trees and the living tree itself. And that enabled, of course, the comparison of fresh and old herbarium DNA. Martijn used quantitative PCR to find to quantify uh, double-stranded breaks in the DNA and use PCR amplicons and in combination with 454 sequencing to try and find out if there's any miscoding lesions uh, in the herbarium DNA specimens. And this is sort of the overall result, obviously the fresh DNA from the living trees and then young, few weeks, or an old herbarium, young old, young old herbarium that appear to be more or less similar in the amount of degradation. And this is perhaps due to the way these specimens were fixed, usually by heat treatment. From the literature, we know that this can cause depurination, where the purine is dissociated from the sugar phosphate backbone, resulting in a strand break. The other effect of heat treatment could be deamination of the C2 scenes, which you leaves like a CT transition. Now, Martijn, he used quantitative PCR then on the three genomic target loci. Uh, all these loci were targeted from the three genomic compartments and found more or less that whether you're old herbarium or young herbarium, you got the same amount of damage compared with fresh DNA. So really the, the difference between young and old herbarium was not really significant, meaning or we interpret that as it doesn't really matter how old you're laying or how old you are or how many years you've been laying at the shelf in a herbarium. It's the initial damage that counts, probably the damage done using heat treatment. Then we moved on to looking at polymerase bypassable damage and we did that by sequencing amplicons with 454 sequencing technology which is not heard of anymore. I think it has sort of disappeared by now. Um, but this would allow you to find miscoding lesions, lesions uh, from amplicons amplified from the different genomic compartments. Over 100 million bases were analyzed and as an example here with the Arabidopsis thaliana and herbarium from 1969 and the six nucleotide substitution types and here is your fresh uh, Arabidopsis thaliana and it's not that much difference perhaps only a doubling of the orange bit and the orange is CT transitions. So when we quantified that further indeed only CT transition miscoding lesions uh, had doubled in frequency in old herbarium compared with fresh chloroplast DNA and for all the rest all the other combinations there was not that much difference we could even estimate a post-mortem CT rate of 1.53 times 10 to the minus 6 nucleotides per year that would change so 
the overall conclusion was that herbarium DNA is amazingly similar to fresh DNA. Could be because of the cell walls, the way it's dried and protected against uh, oxidation in plant samples. Now, something on ancient DNA, you may have seen this kind of study said, this is Neanderthal, and then we see the fragments, um, and, and usually before a, a fragment break, we see an overrepresentation of certain uh, nucleotides. So the typical signature would be an excess of purines just before strand breaks, and an overrepresentation of CT transitions towards the end of the fragments. This is found in ancient DNA, but also in herbarium. Herbarium that may have been heat treated. Uh, this was a nice study by Weiss et al. a couple of years ago. Here it is. And we could confirm this with our own uh, herbarium DNA extractions, finding just before strand breaks the excess of certain um, nucleotides in there. So confirming the pattern that we see in ancient DNA. But in this case with herbarium, probably um, because of treating with heat. So here's the heat treated samples. We see a clear peak before the strand break. And this was herbarium without any heat treated. And it, these peaks it, seem to be absent. So heat treated herbarium looks a bit like ancient DNA. And this is the map damage program that allows you to find these overrepresentations by mapping the reads against your uh, assembled fragments. Why this is the case could have to do with something that's been referred to in the literature as DNA breathing, where the strands would open up and then expose the basis to more oxidation probably. Um, and yielding to more deamination as a result as well. DNA breathing, we haven't heard so much about it, but it seems to be like an interesting explanation why this happens at the end of strand breaks. Now, now I'd like to switch to genome skimming and plastomics and Illumina sequencing technology, which indeed, as you are well aware, seem to be sort of made for ancient or for herbarium DNA because it needs fragments anyway to run the technology. So that's good. And you may have seen this thing said, what's happening in Illumina sequencing. There is a single stranded template attached to the, sur to the, to a substrate and that we have bridge PCR happening and followed by sequencing. And the sequencing that happens here is your insert, your, your herbarium DNA fragment. And after adapters have been attached, it sequenced both sides inwards into the fragment, usually like 150 bases, maybe more. I don't know what it is today. Genome scheming is where you would aim for high copy numbers only from the genome, the nuclear genome. So here is one repeat and another, for instance, if it's sequenced with Illumina sequencing, for instance. Um, upon assembly, all these reads that are sitting at the same region are sort of stacked as if this would have been one region, but with a much higher coverage. So the repeated element is then collapsed into a single contig and the line is drawn, the skimming, and you only take this part uh, for your assemblies. So this would allow then, depending on sequencing depth, to go for the sort of low hanging fruits, which would be ribosomal DNA, which is present in a very high copy number, like 20,000. And then organelle genomes in the hundreds uh, copy number that would easily stack up reads on the same uh, organelle genome. And hence being able to sequence those um, samples relatively easily. When we do our genome skimming from one Illumina read library, we would get like about around 15% or so is uh, derived from chloroplast DNA, a bit less from ribosomal DNA, and the rest is all 
sort of from nuclear genomic um, uh, repeats, which also can be very useful um, in itself. Now, what we did in our synthesis project was then try to scale up a bit and see whether there is any general patterns across uh, angiosperms. So we compiled a set of 17 families, 20 and 94 samples, including recalcitrant taxa, including herbarium up to like 146 years old. And then did uh, assembly using a um, bioinformatics pipeline that we call named iterative organelle genomic assembly or yoga and see how well we could do and basically for 73 out of the 94 samples we got uh, over 70 percent of the plastome for 82 samples there were at least 10 to 30 million reads and only a minority failed or had poor reads so this looked like quite successful and hopeful for the use of herbarium collection material for um, DNA applications. Yoga, our pipeline, it was similar to Han et al. that used the published mitobim for mitochondrial genome assembly in animals. It combines reference and de novo assembly uh, we use an angiosperm plastome sequence reference panel and then use these programs to filter out the reads that are uh, relevant. Um, this could take anything like one hour or a few days to run depending on the structure in the data and, and how well things are covered and the size of the plastome. Um, we use then Chlorobox, which is one of the tools from the Max Planck Institute Potsdam uh, group that um, produces nice software for annotation and in some cases we did these programs for scaffolding however and this is then what it looks like in the yoga setup we have a pool of reeds green are plastid evolved reeds and black are nuclear reeds and we have an angiosperm uh, chloroplast reference panel and then both are brought into contact and some parts of the reference panel will have reads attached to them, especially the conserved homologous parts, that's fine. And from those parts, you generate a new target reference, which is based comprising those uh, fragments of conserved uh, parts. And with that new target reference, we revisit the reads and now we have an new cycle of uh, mapping the reads to our new target reference some of the reads will stick out a bit they will grow uh, the gaps and if you do that a few times you sort of close the gaps and end up with a new target plus tone. of course there could be alternative assemblies and then we provide the ale test and the ale test has nothing to do with drinking beers but it's for uh, assembly likelihood estimation map against the assembly and indirect measures of uh, assembly quality measure that these are the measures repeat condensation pen segmental duplications etc and there are these sort of likelihood plots of each of those aspects it's Bayesian so it's like the posterior uh, of your assembly uh, given the set of reads and then you could do significant testing whether one assembly is significantly better than another only from the same data set of course so you could then use either the ale score or the n50 to choose among your alternative assemblies when they are there that's what we did but now things have been superseded a bit by this nice study by freudenthal et al and they did a relative performance test of a few different organelle um, assembly pipelines including yoga and it turned out that uh, get organelle was the best get organelle pipeline so we're using that too and indeed it, it works a bit faster in some aspects than yoga get organelle in combination with bandage to visualize the results okay so that organelle assembly Back to our reads from the herbarium 
um, set panel of 94 specimens, there was indeed a negative correlation with age of the specimen and number of reads, but not that strong. Green is fresh and red is uh, herbarium. The chloroplast reads are definitely higher in fresh uh, material compared with herbarium. The total number of reads doesn't really differ significantly and the total assembly length either. It's more or less the same when you compare fresh with herbarium uh, DNA. So that's good news again for the use of herbarium specimens. Here are some dot plots of the yoga assemblies in this case for the plastomes where we see Etionema, 146 years, Hymenostegia, 101 year old, 42, Pelagonium, 117 year. Seems to be doing pretty well. In blue, you see the inverted repeat regions. And inverted repeat regions, this is a plot across genomes from um, all the way from ferns to land plants and angiosperms, I believe. Yeah. And in there is always these two inverted repeats that could build the plastome to go in the structure like this, considered to be involved in um, homologous recombination processes that could probably speed up if there's any strand breaks or the repair of damage on plastomes. That's the idea why we have these inverted repeats. Now, when you're looking at plastomes, you will see that the inverted repeat is indeed covered twice the amount in the read. So this can help orientating your assembly or finding your way where things are located. In some cases, we have these three levels of coverage in a coverage plot. Um, that could easily be like the mitochondria, the chloroplast, and maybe ribosomal, because those are the obvious targets for um, genome skimming. And indeed, we do know that there is, have been quite some transfers from chloroplast to mitochondrial. So these green bits are then chloroplast regions inside the mitome. And this can cause assembly pipelines such as yoga, but also others, to start assembling the mitome, starting from this little piece here, where you th thought you were in the chloroplast uh, genome. And that's something to take into account and to uh, try to uh, correct later on in your assembly. Yeah, now this is something on phylogenetics. This is work of my own and my PhD student on the South African Pelagonium species, um, where we usually would select uh, protein coding sequences only and, and ignore the fast evolving spacer and intron sequences. Um, and, and what I mean here is that this is an old study where we did focus on the fast evolving spacers, the turn LF region. And this was a new study where we had 70 gene sequences, I think. Yeah, 76. It was uh, protein coding sequences from the plastome. So we had fewer species, but more characters there, as opposed to the old approach, which was fewer characters, but many, many species. And the discussion indeed is then again, what's better, having more species or more characters included. So genomics in phylogenetics is not necessarily always the magic bullet. Um, here are some more relatively recent studies using herbarium DNA, DNA. And I think this is well covered in this workshop as well. So the retrieval of nuclear loci from herbarium specimens with some sort of hybrid uh, capture um, approach. That's been quite impressive. Um, targeted enrichment through hybrid captures. Lots of sequence data retrieved from fairly old and degraded uh, herbarium DNA. I think this has a quite promising future, but that's, as I said, covered in this workshop as well. Here is another interesting application, I think. Um, it's, it's named here herbariomics um, and the use of repetitive DNA in angiosperms. So what Stephen Dodsworth and uh, colleagues did 
is use herbarium DNA and find that that part of the genome skimming sample, the read library, that's not used for like organelles or ribosomal DNA, but is used to do repeat profiling of the nuclear genome. How many repeat classes are there? Different repeat classes, and what's their abundancy? The larger the abundancy, the larger the square. And that's where it's all they showed quite nicely that there is some good phylogenetic signal in these repeat profiles that can actually give more resolution than with traditional phylogenetic markers is achieved. So this seems to be another nice application of the use of herbarium DNA. Now, finally, I'd like to say something on post-mortem damage in the sense of herbarium genome fragmentation. So we've already seen that the heat treatment could cause the um, purination and hydrolysis of the sugar phosphate backbone over here, a break, and the deamination of cytosines causing uh, transitions. We've also established that there is the single-stranded template that's sequenced and that sequencing proceeds from the outside inside the target uh, DNA fragment. But when the fragmentation was heat induced, the ends are expected to have high AGs uh, content at the end, indeed. And that's what we have seen, uh, which I showed in previous slides. With the insert size being like four, five hundred, six hundred, you're probably fine because the read, the actual sequencing read will be like 150 from both ends. However, with uh, historic DNA, usually this situation can happen that the reads are overlapping across the fragment because the fragment size has become too small. So ideally, your insert size would be more than twice the repeat length, the, the read length, I should say. Uh, this can happen, and even worse would be this, that you start to sequence the adapter region even. Now, try to um, look into this aspect in our panel of 94 uh, herbarium uh, read libraries. And the average fragmentation, fragment length, would sort of drop with specimen age, as perhaps expected. And then if you look at the number of reads pairs joined, that could actually be joined because of overlapping reads, that was also slightly negative correlated with specimen age. And here I have joint read pairs, the number of read pairs that could actually be joined. Um, and this is a slight positive trend in there with specimen age. But definitely, there is quite a number, uh, a high percentage of reads that can actually be joined together and can not be treated as separate um, read pairs anymore. So, you can then merge these overlapping reads, like with BB merge. Uh, and of course, you need to add, remove the adapters. And then the question is, when you have merged reads, will that be better for your uh, reconstruction of your target? I looked into that, and it didn't seem to be that much different. But I must admit, it was only a cursory look. So maybe if this is studied more in detail, it may be beneficial to merge your reads before using them in assembly. Now, when I then looked at herbarium DNA fragmentation in two instances where we had a series of increasingly older specimens, it was the case for Lactuca, where we have from fresh material to 36 up to like 64 years old specimens, and the same for Etionema. Uh, from fresh specimens up to like 146 years old. And if you then look at the distribution in um, the length of fragments obtained, so here are the length in bases, 
and here are the short fragments where the reads will overlap and here are the longer fragments like 156 and 76 where there is uh, fewer overlap or less overlap then you can see that there is this sort of distribution that most of the um, uh, samples in very old um, specimens will have like around 50 base pairs length fragments um, but it, the, the relation with the age of the specimens doesn't seem to be very clear yeah and that leads me to another aspect that Weiss et al addressed in their study the temporal patterns of damage and decay kinetics of DNA from archival specimens Weiss et al concluded that they had to merge the herbarium reads prior to filtering and assembly and they found 96% of reads merged first 21% in modern DNA and like in our data it was like 80-85% being uh, merged 85% of the reads being merged Weiss et al did these analyses to try and, and find the decay rate and they had came up with this rate of 1.66 10 to the minus 4 per year which is six times the rate known for bones uh, at which DNA appears to decay when we looked at this uh, the distribution of all these different um, fragment lengths uh, from 26 to 200 bases uh, so with short fragments and longer we found this interesting uh, almost yeah gamma distribution like uh, distributions for the several for all the different um, uh, specimens and I'm still not sure why we see this pattern but it could have to do with um, and just a technical aspect on the flow cell of the sequencer um, here it is again and in coloration is now the age of the specimens indicated and we see fresh samples over here with higher fragment length and the shorter fragments length tend to be a bit more younger in age yeah then we we sort of wondered about can we perhaps simulate how genomic fragments tend to end up in uh, a series of fragments and would it be worthwhile modeling this this is just started so we're not uh, conclusive about this but these are some examples of sim simulations where we allow a strand to break in different parts and use different um, statistical distributions for that and see what would fit the observed patterns that we have best um, like here that breaks are exponentially distributed um, and at varying length the main point is that we hope to be able to test what function fits the fragment length that we see best is there some deviation from randomness um, is a correlation with the AG occurrence in the genome schemes and uh, correlating with the fragment uh, ends uh, do genome schemes that we know they represent mostly genomic repeat fractions but what determines the gamma shape parameters if it's a gamma shape distribution what do they represent uh, maybe it's it's not a single order kinetics but two process two processes that are driving the buildup of these fragment distributions or could it just be a, a sequencing artifact uh, that's still underway so in conclusion then I would like to conclude that herbarium plastomics works and it is irrespective of specimen age herbarium DNA has a sort of signature similar to ancient DNA excess of AG um, before strand breaks more TC transitions at fragment ends yeah using the currently available pipelines such as get organelle but also our yoga uh, there's no need for having close references uh, you, you make use of the conserved parts of a few reference uh, plastomes that have been conserved across land plants uh, genome skimming sort of promising but the short herbarium DNA fragment length may clash with 
perhaps tomorrow's Illumina read length. Um, because if that read length is becoming longer and longer, it becomes less cost effective to try and do short uh, historic fragments of genomic DNA. So hopefully the, the old Illumina technology will be there for a while still. Um, you could think of merging herbarium reads prior to assembly. Um, for nuclear herbarium genomics, targeted enrichment and repeat profiling seem to be most promising when using herbarium DNA. And finally, then the fragment length distribution may suggest some sort of two step kinetic process in the degradation uh, of genomic DNA from herbarium. And with that, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention and uh, I will be uh, present in the discussion for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much.